Ho, 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 ho. Christmas is coming. It is a massive fraud. Jesus Christ never existed. The people that have revealed it are really brave. They do not turn their face to the camera. That's all we get to see about the head of the man Abelard Reuchlin. Let me just introduce you to the two speakers and who they are and you can look the, them up on the internet for yourself. The research is profound. They present it on a scribble board and it is the most amazing story that I have ever heard in my life. I'm a professor of neuroscience and I've taught and researched in both hemispheres in this beautiful earth that the gods created and I now understand entirely the human contribution to messianic religions which are a total fraud but a master plan for owning the world for 2,000 lethal genocidal and uh, holocaust driven missionary driven culling of the pagans driven brutal years it is really really sad and when you listen to episodes 4 and 5 of the 5 that have been made by these pair the tears will come into your eyes Hi, my name is uh, Douglas Bode, I am the publisher of Vector Associates and uh, uh, after 30 plus years I finally got my friend Abel Reichen to do an interview of his infamous or famous book called The True Authorship of the New Testament some of you may have seen it advertised in Nation, New Republic, etc. Where it says, Flavius Josephus writes New Testament. Well, uh, he's the first one in history that openly wrote about it and figured out the whole family relationship of who wrote the New Testament, when the books were written, the code systems that the Pisos used in writing it. So if you're a theologian, that's a professional. Uh, regardless whether you're uh, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, uh, Jewish, or even if you're Muslim and curious about uh, this whole story, you're going to love this. This is a real treat. You're going to learn more about not only Roman history, but the code systems and, and how it was written and the proof that Abelard is right and everybody else is wrong. Many, many people are curious about the New Testament. They can't understand why a small group of supposedly persecuted Christians could persevere in the catacombs for 35 years, hiding from the Roman legionaries who supposedly are trying to find and kill them. And the legionaries knew the catacombs far better than did these poor, straggling, uneducated Christians. For sure. And it's a mystery. Where were they for 35 years, and how did they come out of the catacombs? Well, in the line, after 35 years, the great new leaders that nobody had ever heard of before. Where did the Christians come from? How did they escape the legionaries in the catacombs for 35 years? That's how I got on to it. I was an attorney for over 50 years. But like many people want to become an attorney and they don't make it, I made it to become an attorney and I always wanted to become a detective. Well, I read Agatha Christie, I read Sherlock Holmes, and then I got on to the New Testament because I was so curious about how did they manage to hide for 35 years in the catacombs? Okay, so that is about one third of the way through the first of the videos. I'm going to summarize it because you can watch them for yourself. It is extremely, extremely complex because it is tremendously important that the fraud stops now and that this world, which is technologically capable uh, but horribly corrupted, could be a peacefully prosperous place 
within a year or two of these revelations being made and shared with the global populace. It is a massive money stream and it is intensely complex. Uh, uh, a lot of this, this was started in Rome, in regions relatively close to Rome, uh, and Velius Paterculus, Paterculus was the father of two characters who are particularly important. One of them was Flavius Josephus, and they were in the river Sabine region, uh, and the people that were working with him have got nicknames like Farilis and Scrabonius Ianus, and one of the the brother or the son of Paterculus, one was Flavius Josephus, who's relatively prominent in the search engines if you look for him early on in this story, uh, and the other person in the Flavian dynasty that was the son of Paterculus is actually Vespasian the Emperor in Rome at that time uh, and his son Titus ruled from 79 AD and there were a series of deaths in the Flavian family that ended with the killing of Domitian in the year 96 AD. Now Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD and that was when some of the later characters were in a position to start publishing the really important bulk of the New Testament. Jokes are vicious. They will help to drive home the story more than anything else I can tell you about the complicated genealogy and the numbering, coding, the numbering system that allowed us to decode it and to decipher who the authors were and why they wanted to be remembered in human history. They knew that one day they would be found out and Abelard Reuchlin and his colleague in the publishing sector found them out and it's only because of the dedication of very very rare websites now to revealing this precious cause uh, that I have been able to find the story and to pick up on it. And then we get into a chap called Gaius Calpurnius Piso he takes over and the links of this to popular culture and to the jokes are massive the stories about King Arthur in the UK were actually written by the Roman popes not in English for obvious reasons Latin was the lingo of the day but that when I learn that <laughs> the father of Arthur was also related to the Flavians and that is a chap called Furius, Furias Pendragon you can see the Freemasonic jokes coming through Furias that's a hairy assed creature that is the head of the kingdom that wanted to be civilized and is entirely mythological written by papal figureheads uh, and then the fourth person in the first half of these listings in the genealogical trees is what they call the man now the man that you hear all about on the golf course in every big tournament around the world you're the man you're the min all of that relates to the Piso stories and all of the jokes that are told to them uh, and you can see that if you look for Arius Calpurnius Piso who's the prominent author of most of the books in the Bible and most of the chapters uh, that Reuchlin describes that when you look for Arius Calpurnius Piso on the websites way back when they published this book which I believe was in 1981 they eventually found a publisher with courage they talk a lot about not showing Abelard Reuchlin's face because of the possibility that if he became a public figure that he would be taken out that is entirely intended by these jokers 
it is there to control the masses now the mass is the celebration of the death of its martyr in the Christian church the Roman Catholic church every Sunday that's the masses being controlled and that is one of the sick jokes Arius Calpurnius Piso wrote the majority of them uh, the present Mark, Luke, John Acts of the Apostles uh, and you've got other writers like Proculus contributing later on uh, Pliny and Justus Julius and which is another name for John and Fabius Justus were the uh, the uh, real creators of the later chapters uh, and this was operating around the period 100 AD or 115 AD okay uh, and you can see that there is an intensely complicated numerical code in the system uh, and you can see that if you look at it relatively closely that it is based on numbers and just jiggling letters around uh, if you look at that image there you've got encoding for authenticity let God be true but every man a liar Romans 3.4 now when scholars and clerics and theologians begin to cite sentences like that it comes over with a massive amount of authority as if it were the words of God himself all of this is a stitch up and a fake by a really intelligent family of elite Romans that were in the Roman court and were in it only for a mind control mechanism if you control minds and you literally control the masses you can cast the fear of death and hell and purgatory into the mind of the masses and it then becomes really important for them just to become compliant and the authors that the speakers describe how you no longer need soldiers and policemen on every street corner to keep the peace because the doctrine that they have read or they have heard from the preacher there's another story about the numbers of people that were killed by King Arthur single handedly <laughs> uh, and all of it is just about a declaration that the number that we're telling you here is a declaration that this is the author of the New Testament who's writing this little s segment okay and the key number for him was in that case 960 people uh, and th remember that this is written by popes so King Arthur in the UK was able to protect the English army and he was able to single handedly kill 960 people that's the same number that were killed in the suicide of the uh, zealots at the Masada battleground and what it exemplifies is that 300 is the letter T in the coding system that Christos or the word the, or the letter Chi is 600 and Calpurnius Piso the main author of these segments was the letter was the number 60 and that takes you to 960 and in the early days of the Arthurian story that was enough to convince the Freemasons and the followers only the elites only the leaders of the church got to know about the fraud if you could speak Latin in the king's court or in the cardinal's presence you would be in the inner circle and you would be aware of everything that's happening there we can see those numbers again 600 is Christ, 300 is the cross 60 is Jesus and KP is Calpurnius Piso the author they explained how the Piso that created the uh, virgin birth was actually fathered 
by another emperor, the father Gaius Piso, and you can see the link here to Arius Calpurnius Piso. He's the man they call Piso the Bigwig, the man. Yeah, he's the one that did most of the biblical writings. There is his dad, Emperor Gaius Caligula, and his mum is Aria. And the mums, the areas, there's a senior member of that family and there's a junior member of the family. The place where they sell the books and that postcode has become a T-Mobile vent. Now T-Mobile is a joke about the Christian cross and there you can see the letter T and this is a joke made on the 27th October T-Mobile welcome back so the cross is the T and welcome back is a thickened joke about the resurrection let me show you how futile and infantile and jocular it is T-Mobile is one of the big phone companies and basically what they're saying is that we are going to execute you we are going to monitor your every activity because we hack your phone we have billions of Christians around the globe now and they are now becoming aware that their leaders are asset stripping everything that they used to have as poor parishioners uh, and look at the magnitude of the laugh Turn of the man. Can you see it? Can you see that almost all of them understand it now? This used to be a well kept secret. Everyone in the news media understands it now. The icon for the Pisos is the horse. The hippos swim around in a circle in the BBC news broadcasts at the beginning of the programme. They love to proclaim their might and their topicality in sharing a joke about the stealing of the world from its people you see them knocking the nails in wait till you see the arms outstretched in the messianic martyrs role there we go there you go en masse like the Monty Python's team always look on the bright side of life if you're an elite at Oxford or Cambridge or University College London and you learn ancient history like the lead singer at Coldplay, Chris, I forget what his name is, he understands entirely the fraud. They are trained to have a laugh at the enslavement of the Christian nations uh, and the missions that sell it now are entirely for profit at the top of the church the poor people get robbed they contribute to the food bank they contribute to the collection plate and all of the money gets laundered all of the denominations get tax breaks if you want to understand it let's just scan through some of these pages on my website which is Prof George Lee's revelations faking the new testament a master plan for geopolitical denomination eh, geopolitical domination okay and you can see that we have jokes like this the loaves and fishes story about Je Je Jesus feeding the 500 listeners and followers 5000 I think it was he had two fishes and five loaves the joke is that when Roman soldiers laid, le laid siege to a city they used a technique they called loaves and fishes they would fake bread, bake bread with fecal matter, 
mixed into it and amputate the penises of captured citizens of the city and throw the loaves and fishes over the besieged city walls. It's well known that Roman slang for the word penis was fish. It is no coincidence that Jesus performs the miracle of loaves and fishes. It's a cruel Roman joke and all over popular culture you can see it replayed. Now the character's name when when the inbreeding occurred with Caligula and Arius Calpurnius Piso and Gaius's wedding night uh, or within the first month of their marriage the emperor was able to sire the child that wrote most of the chapters. Now the, the mother was given in the biblical story the mother was given the name Mariam so that you could tell that that was the author wanted to be both the mother and the child uh, and Caligula was the father God in the it was not an immaculate conception it was an illegitimate child uh, sired by the emperor the loaves and fishes joke by putting a penis in a pile of shit and basting it into bread and gluing it together that way what you've got there is a joke about this all of it is a sick profiteering joke against the citizens there's the pen dragon do you get that one? the pen is the power base in religion writing was invented in Canaan they used blue dye initially that was the first dye stuff to be invented and Canaan is God's anvil in the uh, Lawrence of Arabia jokes and in the Lawrence of Arabia jokes the two homosexual who stick the stick up the camel's arse now the cam camel and the camilla and the camel coat is also part of the piso joke the two poofs <laughs> in popular culture that stuck the stick up the arse of the camel in that massive movie about the interplay between decent Britons abroad and the suppressed locals the names of the two Arabs homosexuals were Dodi and Fayed and, and uh, the head of the UKIP Faraj Dodi and Faraj all of it is a vicious joke all of the Old Testament keeps getting replayed in current affairs Barak's in it Lady Aga's in it it is all pathetic all of it is replayed the names are made up so that the, they can be related to Josephus the author or they can be related to the Miriam person and the presence of the author in that scene, scene just like Alfred Hitchcock did in his movies you can see the sword is just another icon for the Christian cross and the bloody cowls father of one of the people in this story is called Nun and that is how the nuns get their title <laughs> it is ever so fascinating but the jokes are ever so sick there's one of them do you get it? there is the penis with some mustard on it on this occasion and that is the hot dog joke if you watch films like the right stuff about choosing German rocket scientists, nuclear physicists to come and enter this elite team to invent the rockets that eventually are deployed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki all through that film you hear the actors exuberantly declare hot dog and they clap their hands together they give high fives as they declare the hot dog word it's a joke about loaves and fishes it's a joke about your penis in a sandwich and about the starving of people in the Roman Empire when their city was under siege you, when I was an altar boy in the 1960s you used to have to eat fish on a Friday and that means that your dad got sex with your mum and if he was really lucky he would get a second coming 
it is so sick it is unbelievable